Welcome to Army National Guard Combat Field Studies Digital Edition. Today we're back with Captain Jonathan Bratton, Command Historian of the Maine Army National Guard, to talk about his role as a Command Historian and how he affects the M-Day Force with the history of the Maine Army National Guard. Captain Bratton, for those who don't remember you from the last episode, can you give us a little background? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, first off, thanks so much for having me on. It's always a real privilege to be able to uh, be on here with you guys. Uh, you, Leader Development does a uh, fantastic job putting out products all the time. I always appreciate that and like to use it for my folks whenever I can. The um, Yeah, so my background in the Maine Army National Guard really begins in the Ohio National Guard where I enlisted as an infantryman and then uh, transferred over to the uh, engineer side of the house after I sort of came to my senses and realized that carrying your back all or carrying your house on your back all the time really put a did a number on your knees uh, the irony being that I guess suppose that I eventually end up in command of a light sapper company where light means you know you've got more stuff to carry that goes boom uh, but uh, yeah I've j enjoyed being a being an engineer officer and then uh, on the command historian side, it was a position that the Maine Army National Guard opened up in 2014, coincidentally, just as I was coming back from Afghanistan. And uh, it was one of those weird situations of being up at 1 a.m. in Afghanistan and getting the email from from back home from Maine saying, hey, we, are you still interested in this job? And I said, of course I am. You know, who wouldn't want to be the historian for Joshua Chamberlain and the 20th Maine? And uh, so I've been very lucky to be holding that position ever since. All right, so let's take your historian hat off for a minute. So as an M-Day company commander, why is your unit's history important, and how can you use that to affect not only your training, but your readiness and retention as well? Oof, that's a big one. The big, the big R, the readiness and retention. All right, so the way I look at it as a company commander, I've got tons of stuff on my plate. It just seems like there's never-ending taskers out there for, uh, and uh, and people are always adding to not taking from and uh, uh, from the historical standpoint there's a multitude of ways that history can help me as a commander both understand my own readiness uh, and understand um, how to retain soldiers so one uh, obviously for retention you're esprit de corps um, being able to use your unit's history to be able to paint a picture and say hey look you know yeah, sure. It sucks right now because it's raining in JRTC. Guess what? You know, it sucked for us in Mirs Argonne and we kept going. It sucked for us on on the in the Solomon Islands. You know, hey, at least it's raining. You know, you know, you're not getting uh, you're not having anybody bomb you and pop out of foxholes and, and bamboo caves and uh, and pillboxes and try to shoot you. So, you know, it'll be all right. You'll get through JRTC. It'll be cool. Uh, so you can use that. You can use your own history for esprit de corps purposes from a readiness perspective um there is something to be said for being able to do a look back so what i do as the, from the command historian role is i advise the command on how history can be important from a, a staff operations procedure so for example when we talk about recruiting and retention in 1983 the main army national guard was leading the, the nation in strength which were kind of you know Retention and strength management is a touchy subject right now within a lot of the states of the National Guard. Uh, some states are able to do it very well. Others are, are struggling somewhat. Uh, so we go we go back and we look at, all right, what, are, what were we doing in 1983 that we weren't doing now? Where were we? How many recruiters did we have? What was the message that we were pushing? What was our brand? Uh, and those are things that we can take and, and use to actually develop strength maintenance plans uh, within the state. Um, and then so as a commander, the way I do look at it is I look at how am I doing community engagement? How am I working with our recruiters to be able to engage this community that I've been in, you know, that this unit has been in for 200 years? Uh, does the community know I'm here? <laughs> you know, that, that should always be your first question, because as the National Guard, we sometimes uh, over the past 20 years, we've moved out of our communities. Um, in a, in a lot of cases and uh, having that community engagement is just so key. Uh, and so there's, those are just this, a few of the ways, you know, I, as being historically minded as a commander, um, my soldiers already know that, uh, you know, there's probably going to be some historical element thrown in whenever the commander takes over the formation. Uh, but even just this last weekend, uh, this last drill weekend, we went out to a historical site in Maine um, where we had a uh, third system era fortification, Fort Popham, 
from the Civil War, and then a uh, Endicott system uh, period fortification of uh, Fort Baldwin through World Wars One and uh, and Two. So we were able to go and say, hey, look, yeah, this isn't stuff that we do en- anymore as engineers, but once upon a time, this is what engineers were. Uh, this this was our bread and butter. And, you know, getting down to the weeds and say, hey, what is this actually? You know, what are you looking at? You're looking at fields of fire. You're looking at protection. You're just doing big engagement area development, right? And being able to show that. And so there's a little bit of tactical learning there. But then there's also celebrating our own past and our heritage as engineers. And so, uh, yeah, it gets everybody out of the armory, put them in civilian clothes, walk around, yell at everyone to keep six feet away from each other. Um, And, uh, (laughs) and, uh, but, you know, there's there's that piece where suddenly uh, it was just something that they pass signs to. And now they can go, oh, hey, you know, we, you know, that's part of my history. That's part of my heritage. And it gives them something additional to be proud of. Can you tell me a little bit about the diverse ways you share the history of the Maine Army National Guard with the force? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, yeah, the, the company I have the privilege to command is the 251st Engineer Company in Norway, Maine. It's actually been there since uh, since 1800. Um, officially, it goes back to 1810. My first predecessor was actually court-martialed for fire, uh, fighting a duel in uh, during the War of 1812 up at Plattsburgh in 1814. So, you know, I, as I always say, I can only go up from here. But... Uh, the ways that I like to use, uh, you know, I use the unit history as much as possible for uh, for my particular M-Day force. Uh, but as far as for the rest of the main Army National Guard, I try to provide products to commanders to actually literally show them how does history affect readiness. Because as we know, everything is tied to readiness these days. If it can't be a metric somehow, you know, it doesn't really matter. Uh, it, if it's not in DTMS, it didn't happen. Um, but unfortunately, as a historian, there's no historical record inside DTMS. Uh, so I guess you know, it's up to interpretation. Uh, but I like to be able to, uh, to provide these products um, in order to build a unit esprit de corps and show where units have, uh, have, have been in their past, what our soldiers have done. And uh, I've gotten very lucky to be able to be a part of a couple things outside the organization that have assisted with that. Uh, for example, back in uh, back in 2016, I got a, a, to be a part of a Smithsonian Channel documentary called Americans Underground, Secret Cities of World War I, um, that involved going to France and actually going to these underground quarries, these old caverns that have been used by Maine National Guard troops during World War I as shelter uh, with uh, their names and units carved into the walls. Uh, it was one of those weird situations where you're looking at names that, uh, you know, you've studied for a long time. You've seen those rosters and everything, and there they are in living stone on the wall. Uh, and so that was a, a great way to be able to uh, to give back to the force. That's an incredible opportunity. And that, I mean, the reach of that goes far beyond uh, just the, the main Army National Guard. I mean, something like that is seen by the general public. And um, you know, really drives home the point of how important the Army National Guard was in, in the victory in World War I. But uh, that's not the only time you got to go to France for the job. Is that correct? Yeah, I feel like I'm absurdly spoiled by the opportunities that the Guard has given me. Uh, uh, in part because of that documentary, um, I got another phone call during the, the run up to the uh, World War I centennial in 2018 asking if I would represent... Uh, New England and, and the Yankee Division, the 26th Division, for the um, uh, for the centennial of the celebration of the Army's centennial commemorations for World War One, uh, and so that was I talk about a huge honor uh, going over there, uh, leading a staff ride uh, through the battlefields with the representatives of the 26th Division units. Um, I got to take some of my soldiers in my company uh, into a trench line uh, where they attacked out of uh, on July 18 or July 20th, uh, 1918. Uh, so members of those same that same unit uh, in that in that same area, almost 100 years. And I think it was like a few days to the day later. So that was something that. Uh, you can't really put a price tag on. Uh, similarly, the seeing the way that the French people showed a remarkable uh, just gratitude a hundred years on, the way that they opened their homes, their their towns to us, 
and uh, the, the the celebrations and the little the little moments of um, you know just even having you know kids come up uh, to the to the commander of the 28th division and uh, and and recognize the patch on his arm as the patch that was on their bridge in theme that they'd seen their whole lives and just totally wigging out. Uh, and even though neither of them spoke uh, each other's language, they could totally understand exactly what was the, you know, the connection that was there. So that was just um, incredibly moving experience and also very exciting. And you, you know, I'm a little bit partial to the Keystone and to Theme, so uh, definitely hits home for me. I mean, staff rides are such an incredible experience to to not only learn that connection to the lineage and past of your unit, but also some you know pretty endearing battlefield lessons that you know your predecessors have, have earned with their their blood in some cases. Um, can you tell me a little bit about you know how a staff ride uh, affects the the M Day soldier of today? How how we can learn from those events? Sure, yeah. Uh, properly done, the staff ride is a really compelling training event. You know, a lot of people look at it as, oh, it's just a nice day out. No, it's it's training. Um, the, Ar- the Army regulation says that you may utilize training funds for to conduct staff rides. Uh, and so when you do it with your preliminary study, uh, going over um, primary source documents, going over maps, going over campaign plans, and then you do your terrain walk, and uh, if, if, you know, there's a gazillion different ways to do it. Um, you could, you can have people present at each stop. Uh, you can uh, bring in subject matter experts from the outside. You can bring in living history presenters. One of the, one of the coolest things that I've seen has been uh, doing a staff ride for the Mississippi National Guard at Lexington and Concord and watching a bunch of their O5s and, and up and E9s go through close order drill under the supervision of a uh, British Grenadier reenactor. Uh, so that was a, a, a neat way to show how different people thought at that time. And so you go into tactics and you go into technology, uh, but at the heart of the staff ride is the decision point. Uh, I always like to bring people to the decision point and say, okay, we always take it for granted that this thing happened. Well, that thing didn't have to happen. That was a human choice. That was a leader's choice or a group of individuals choices that led to that thing happening that we now call history. And so therefore we can teach the lessons uh, that leaders are going to need in the future in a bloodless way. Uh, you know, same. It, that's why we always call it training. It comes back to being able to show those moments, be on the ground, see that crease in the terrain, and realize, oh yeah, no, that's a dead zone. You know, anybody who's ever sat on a 240 for a while knows, you know, that you've got dead space and and you don't. And uh, it's the same same principles that can apply. So it's really. Uh, and then you have your, your period where you sum it all up, you wrap it all up, uh, where you soak in the lessons learned and you give those individuals something to take back to their units. And uh, that's a real reward of a staff ride. Absolutely. There's definitely a lot you can draw from being on the ground itself and from, you know, trying to picture it from your foxhole with a 240 and tripod set up. You know, it, it really changes the experience from reading it in a, in a textbook. So outside of staff rides, you know, what are some of the other ways that you use history in the Maine Army National Guard? So some of the other things that I do inside the Maine Army National Guard is uh, I do units lineages. And a unit's lineage is like its birth certificate. So you look at it, and it's a piece of paper. And for most people, you know, it's just giving a lot of dates, you know, organized uh, on this date, federally recognized on this date, brought into federal service for this, brought into federal service for that. Um, but what it does, it doesn't tell all the little stories, but what it does is say, here's all the places that we've been and here's the things that we've done. It'll list your campaign credit, it'll list how far back the unit goes, and it'll list the type of formations that your unit has uh, has has been. So for example, uh, my company, uh, the 251st, uh, up until 1959, they were infantry all the way through. That was the only thing they knew through the Civil War, uh, War of 1812, the Spanish-American War, World War One, World War II, uh, ra- racking up all sorts of campaign credit. And then by 1959, the guard's like, hey, you're going to be armored calves. <laughs> like, okay. Uh, and then two years later, hey, you're going to be armored. Uh, and, then, uh, and then in 1967, uh, converting to engineer. Um, and then back in 2008, converting from horizontal engineer to combat engineer. Why does that matter? It matters because your formation's 
they change a lot unless you get to be lucky and be part of the 28th division where you guys have almost kept your your whole dug on uh you know 1917 formations um change is a part of the army life and if we can show units hey you've changed before you've adapted and look you're doing great you're still a highly functioning high performing ready unit uh and then if you look down at the bottom of the the lineage you've got your campaign uh your campaign credits and your unit awards and that's that's the that sense of pride those are those streamers that hang on the battalion colors or brigade colors or you know you can order them for your company guide on um i would be lying if i said that i hadn't done that and you know we we got a lot of campaigns we like to we like to show off what we've done but uh it's a it's a way of demonstrating to the m day force hey look you come from a a uh a really prestigious background. And then one of my favorite things to do is be able to do the research to push that those units, get those units, um, you know, push them further back in time uh, or get them additional battle honors because the, you know, the, the book hasn't been fully written on every single lineage. There's always more research to be done. There's always more units that are involved and there's different ways that you can, uh, you can manage to get units a little bit more of a pedigree. Uh, and with that, comes more of that unit pride of saying hey we've been around since we've been around since 1859 we were at little round top i mean the 133rd gets to do that all the time they can say they were at little round top and they were at uh bunker hill and uh monmouth saratoga you know that's pretty cool it's very cool to be able to to have soldiers realize that yeah absolutely i mean those <clears throat> distinctive unit insignia, those unit awards, all that stuff is something that a soldier may put on his uniform, but if he doesn't understand you know, the background for it or why it says what it says or where it came from, it really is a whole part of the story of their individual unit pride that they're missing out on. Yeah, absolutely. So by studying all this and, and conducting these staff rides and taking the Smithsonian to uh, caves underground in France, you've definitely amassed quite a bit of knowledge on the main Army National Guard. Can you tell us a little bit about your most recent project? So, yeah, it was um, as, a, as a product of the Smithsonian Channel documentary, out of the notes that I compiled on that, um, I started going, man, I'm getting a lot of, a lot of history of the, the main guard in World War I. Um, and then uh, sort of as, as time went on leading up to the centennial, and I started doing more speaking events around the state talking about the main guard in World War I, and just what its soldiers did, uh, I started getting, you know, the phone calls, the emails, the, hey, I've got my uncle, you know, my great uncle's trunk, uh, and it's got all of this stuff in it. Would you like to take a look? Or, um, you know, we're looking, we're cleaning out a house and we found this old diary, you know, would you be interested? And I'm like, of course I'm interested. <laughs> um, and uh, so over time, it sort of became uh, kind of apparent that I needed, I needed to write this up that there were just so many incredible stories coming out of this one particular unit that it not only was telling a main specific story, but it was telling a National Guard story and it was telling an Army story. Uh, and so a, probably over about four years of research um, went into putting together this, this book, uh, which was published this year. Uh, it's called uh, To the Last Man, a National Guard Regiment in the Great War, 1917 to 1919, published by the Army University Press. And uh, it, yeah, it came together as a as a uh, a product of a lot of a lot of primary source research, um, and, and some of it just literally fell into my lap. I think the the biggest indication that I needed to write this thing was um, uh, I got a call from the state historian who said, "Hey, uh, we've got this we've got this combat log of uh, of this lieutenant, and uh, we found it." in a house that was condemned and it was sitting on a pile of trash and someone happened to be walking by, picked it up, realized what it was. And I'm like, okay, well, that's, yep, yeah, that's, that's cool. And I'm going through and reading it. And it's from a Lieutenant in company D of the 103rd infantry, which is the company that I command now the 251st engineer company. And then uh, some of my colleagues in Massachusetts send me some letters and they say, hey, we found these letters are from the 103rd. They were in our YD collection. You guys should have them from the same lieutenant. <laughs> and then I get 
uh, email from uh, from a lady who said, oh, I've got, I uh, just want to share with you some letters from my grandfather uh, to this lieutenant, uh, also in the same company. Also, this is the same lieutenant. And uh, at that point, I realized, I was like, all right, dude, I get it. Like, you are reaching back from the past, tapping me on the shoulder and saying, you got to write this thing. Uh, and so he did. His, his, uh, his combat journal plays a big role in it, a big piece in it. Um, but it is a I like to call it a collection of stories that are not specific just to Maine and New England, but are also specific to National Guard soldiers all across the country. Because uh, what the 103rd Infantry does in World War One is very similar to, so, you know, for example, the 28th Division. Many of those experiences will be will sound very familiar to soldiers who are who are um, well read on their uh, their unit history. Um, or even just to the National Guard in general. Uh, a lot of the experiences they have during their mobilization and their train-up, yeah, they sound very familiar to a lot of us who go to mobilization stations and you're sitting there for you know a couple months <laughs> and ready to just get out the door at the end of it. And uh, so a lot, of, uh, a lot of very similar situations. And then, uh, honestly, it's, it, it gets into the larger aspects as well, which is, how did the American Expeditionary Force evolve as a tactical fighting force through World War I? How did we go from an army that looked sort of like the Civil War to suddenly an army where if you threw one of our soldiers into it right now, they would have no problem. They would pretty much understand the formations, the tactics, and what they needed to do. Uh, and then how do you incorporate the reserve component into this massive mobilization, this massive force where the army goes from, you know, just about under half a million between uh, active and uh, and reserve component to an army of four million with two million moving overseas, uh, and how do you mobilize the reserve component for that? So that's sort of what went into it and in what it became. It became, I think, a lot more than what I ever expected it to be. Yeah, it's absolutely incredible. It's and I think so many times reading through the history of the Army National Guard and. For me, especially reading World War One history, there's so many things that can be drawn. Similar comparisons, like you said, exactly to our mobilizations and our deployments. You know, augmenting uh, the active component or fighting alongside them in some cases. So uh, that's such a great experience, and it's incredible that you were able not only to document it for the Maine Army National Guard, but have it published on a platform that the rest of the army and, and really the rest of the country can take a look at and understand what it meant to be a guardsman in World War One. And that's that's thanks to Army University Press. Um, I, you know, because because this was something I did as part of my work. It did need to be a it, it needed to be a government uh, a government published work. Um, just you know, in, in fairness to the taxpayers and um, and really just for accessibility purposes. You know, this needed. I, I viewed it as this needed to be something that everyone could have access to and not be restricted by uh, you know buying it or not. And so I reached out to Army University Press, and they were fantastic to work with. Um, I think um, from our first talks to publication was just a little bit over a year. Uh, you know, all the multiple rounds of edits and building maps and choosing images and everything like that. Um, always super wonderful to work with. Um, very, uh, very willing to, um, you know, I kind of, they were like, well, you know, maybe a little less, uh, you know, we're not sure. Do you need all the local stuff in there? And I said, yes, I absolutely do. This is a National Guard story. This is about communities. And then after I explained it, they're like, oh, yeah, no, you're right. That that needs to be in there. Uh, so so I was able to present a product that not only captures the big picture, but also captures what it's like on the home front. Um, in some cases, following a soldier uh, from the really the point of injury, the point of where they became a casualty. Um, to the field hospital, uh, to where they die, how they're interred, and then how the family finds out about the process. And all of that that undergoes. Um, very painful, a very painful thing to trace, but a highly necessary thing because families form the backbone of who we are. We are a community-based organization in the National Guard. We can't do anything without our families. Uh, and sometimes they undergo just horrendous, a horrendous um, uh price really is is what it gets down to um and then <clears throat> even even beyond that following after the war when the gold star mothers began their pilgrimages back to uh the american cemeteries in europe and uh and visiting their their sons over there 
and and just showing how it takes you know it is it takes an entire society to go to war and the cost of war is is um, impacts that society as well that's absolutely incredible and i think it, it is such an important thing as we talk about the national guard today what a role our families play so it's excellent that you not only you know captured that combat experience and that training experience in the national guard but also how it affected the families of those soldiers that were deployed uh, in 1917 and 1918. So I think I'd be remiss if I didn't give you an opportunity to plug some Maine Army National Guard history sites. Is there anything you want to tell the world about? Sure. So if you want to know, you know, if you're sitting around of a, you know, of a Friday or Saturday and you're going, man, I need some really good uh, entertainment. Uh, check out the Maine Army National Guard history website. Um, it's embedded within the Maine Army National Guard page. You can just Google Maine Army National Guard and you'll see immediately ab uh, about us. Uh, and from there, you can see how the role that the Maine Army National Guard has played in our conflicts ever since uh, really the French and Indian War all the way up through uh, the global war on terror and continues to play uh, today. Um, and then you can also check us out on social media, our Facebook and Instagram pages, Maine, Maine Army National Guard, his, or rather Maine National Guard history. We want to be all encompassing and give our uh, brothers and sisters in blue some stuff to be proud of because they definitely have a lot. Uh, we've got the 101st Air Refueling Wing uh, that is uh, known as the Maniacs. They're ubiquitous. They're everywhere. You can see their stickers at every single PAX terminal all over the world. Uh, they have the best marketing plan ever. Uh, but, uh, yeah, we're very proud of our history and, uh, they can, uh, so you can go ahead and check us out on, uh, on social media there. And, uh, I try to mix it up with, uh, a few posts of our, uh, main, main army national guard animals and the unit mascots that we've had, uh, because who doesn't like a picture of a dog in a Jeep? That's outstanding. Well, thank you for coming out, sir. I appreciate you, uh, taking the time to talk with us today and share a little bit about the main army national guard and how it uses history, uh, to affect leader development. Thanks so much for having me on and have a great day. Well, thank you for coming out today, Captain Bratton. And for all those listening from home, uh, be sure to keep following us here at Leaders Recon on Facebook or on Instagram at ARNG underscore leader underscore development, where we'll talk with more folks from across the Army National Guard about readiness, training, and leader development.